Next we go with, uh, Rex Mano was going to be the next one, but he's not here, so we will go to Jim Staples, and I'll just say, take it away, Jim. Thank you, Roger. Uh, my reminiscences um, fall into about roughly three categories. Uh, Colby Street businesses, the old timers' families and homes, and the last sawmill on White Lake. I lived in Grand Rapids uh, during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, and my family spent almost every weekend, spring through fall, at 222 Mears Avenue, which was the, uh, my father's home. And my grandmother uh, still lived there until she died in 38. My mother's brother, Carl G., operated the G and Carr hardware store at the northeast corner of Colby and Mears, which I think is now the uh, furniture outlet store, until his death in 1955. Uh, Carl was from a hardware family. He had an older brother, Merle, younger brother, Lynn. Uh, I don't think the what single store was big enough for both of them, so uh, Merle went to uh, Fremont, had a hardware store, and then he went to Lowell and had a hardware store. And uh, uh, Merle's granddaughter, um, Nancy, a porter, and her husband John have come down from uh, Traverse City to be at this uh, gala affair tonight. And then um, there's also Mary G, who was uh, Everett uh, G, uh, um, Carl G's granddaughter, and Janine Heibel. And I haven't got her relationship quite straightened out, but she's in the granddaughter category too. <laughs> so there's quite a representation from the G family here tonight. The G and Carr hardware store, I'm sure, was a typical small town hardware store. It had long wooden floorboards which creaked, and every imaginable hand tool from shotguns to pitchforks hung from the wall pegs. Nails were displayed in a multi-layered Lazy Susan at the rear of the store in the six, eight, 10, 12 penny trays. And I measured out many five pound bags of 10 penny nails, and I also put a couple of extra in. The home decorating center was in the rear of the store, which included 20 or 30 pigeonholes, each filled with wallpaper, which Carl's, wife's, which Carl's wife, Olivia, we all knew her as Ollie, uh, showed to customers. The store was open to at least 6 o'clock on Saturdays because many farmers came in after 5 p.m. to make their purchases. I noticed that often the men were accompanied by their wives who purchased from a handheld list. And when the sale was run up, rung up, the exact sum was produced by the wife, who I suspected made an earlier scouting trip. All sales were cash except for a few which were on account. Uncle Carl showed me racks and racks of store copies of the on account sales, which he knew would never be paid, but he never refused a sale. At the end of the each day, the big cash register would be emptied, except for the penny compartment. Pennies were thrown into a large wooden Remington shotgun shell case kept under the, uh, under the uh, register. Upon uh, Carl's death, the pennies were counted out at the Whitehall State Bank and amounted to over $500 worth, and they included a number of Indian head pennies. Carl couldn't be bothered with the pennies. Carl. Uncle Carl also ran an ambulance and funeral service business at the rear of the building, which was traditional at that time, and I think traditional across America, uh, for the small town hardware merchant to be the, uh, the ambulance uh, proprietor. Uh, my older brother Henry accompanied uh, Henry Rossler, or another adult, probably Everett G., on uh, two ambulance runs in the huge black Packard that they had. Um, I remember Uncle Carl, towards the end of the summer, uh, summer uh, uh, congratulated my brother Henry. He said, you're batting a 1,000, because uh, my brother had gone on two ambulance runs. Well, the first one was a pathetic case. A lady was so, so sensitive that it took four people each at a corner of a sheet to load her into the ambulance because she was uh, so sore, and she died. And then here's another story that uh, Henry may have to uh, modify or, or confirm. Uh, apparently somebody was missing when they went fishing up in Carlton Creek in the hot August. And he was missing for two or three weeks, but finally he was discovered two or three weeks later in, in the, the swamps in Carlton Creek. And my brother went with either Henry or somebody down there, and uh, when they got to the place, why, um, 
my brother was told to go back to the um, big black packard and, and bring an oil cloth, a shovel, and a bucket. See? <laughs> True? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Were you the one? Yeah. <laughs> I remember my Uncle Carl making many telephone calls to line up pallbearers, and I deduced that the small town hardware store was a more prominent social interchange than drug, grocery, and clothing stores combined are today. Everybody I had apparently had to go to the hardware store at least once a week. Next to the hardware store to the east was um, Carl G's five and ten cent store, whose only product of interest to me uh, was the orange, yellow, and white corn candies made of 110% sugar. <laughs> the next store east was Mr. Dauker's drugstore, which carried the essentials, but not the frills, of Pitkins. Uh, Mr. Dauker was a very gentle man and a very nice man. I have very good memories of him. I'm, I wonder where his family is. Then came Ray Funnel's Barbershop, and uh, reference has been made, and I very well remember um, Going into that barber shop, my dad would kind of get his hair long so he could have Ray Funnel cut it, and we went out in, to what is now Funnel Field and watched the baseball games. And then about the fifth inning, Ray would come by with his with his little cap and go through the stands, and Dad would toss a dollar in, and that's the way they supported the team. Um, oh, next to the um, uh, Funnel's barber shop was the hotel with the. Uh, white brick and green trim, which uh, I think burned down in the late 1940s. We used to go there for Sunday dinner, and all I remember was that they had those uh, ears of uh, corn on the cob, and they always got a cow awful small towards the end. I don't think they had a very good supply of corn. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Leonard and Edna's uh, meat market and grocery store was across the street from the hotel. Leonard was the butcher, and he operated on a two and a half by two and a half foot uh, maple butcher's block, and Edna handled the groceries. And I always wondered why Edna would always put his thumbs by his uh, waist as he was waiting for the uh, scale to show up, but, you know, showing, uh, showing the honesty of the, of the butcher. <laughs> On Saturday evenings, uh, we would have a chocolate soda in Pitkin's Sunken Garden at the rear of the store, and that was a very spiffy place. I've been in there now, and I can't turn around without knocking something <laughs> up. <laughs> the, the State Bank of Whitehall was owned and run by cousin George Koval, who once counted out the incredible sum of $500 to me. It was open about four and a half hours a day, from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., and I'm not even sure it was open Saturday. Across Colby from Pitkins, and about where the Sweet Traditions shop at 108 West Colby is today, was the insurance office of my cousin Guy Koval, who leased the front half to Western Union behind the same long counter. I was amazed at how one man could do four things at one time. He would read the wire, type the message, smoke a cigarette, and participate in the conversation between Guy and my dad. <laughs> We were always in town for the Viking Festival in the fall, when a Viking ship was pushed off from the city dock ablaze with a huge fire, which represented a funeral pyre for a Viking in the days of yore. I particularly recall, <laughs> pardon me, I particularly recall one festival when my dad and I lagged behind mother coming, uh, walking up uh, Colby, as we looked up trying to pick out the big and small dippers. Uh, when one of many inebriated uh, yachtsmen with those fancy caps asked my mother, what you doing tonight, babe? <laughs> to which my father instantly responded, she was taken tonight. <laughs> the final family members of the old-time families who were still alive in the 30s and 40s. Lyman Koval of the Staples and Koval Mill died in 1916. After his first wife died, he married a young lady I knew only as Aunt Mame. Lyman and Aunt Mame had a daughter, Emmeline, and mother and daughter lived in a grand Victorian home just south of Pitkins with a wide wraparound porch where the Verizon phone building and the photography studio are today. Emmeline was a tall, striking woman, very handsome, who never married. My parents said she devoted her life to looking after her mother. 
Our home at 222 South Mears Avenue was directly across Slocum Street from, from the Playhouse, which showed movies every Friday and Saturday night. The smell of popcorn was pervasive and powerful. I remember seeing the Nelson, Eddie, and Jeanette McDonald movies there, and particularly Eddie singing, Give me ten men who are stout-hearted men, and I'll soon give you ten thousand more, and so on. I also remember the low-cut gown on Jeanette, or one of the other beautiful ladies in the cast. The Lindemann House stood in what is now the PNC Bank Building parking lot. It was purchased by Carl G. in the late 1940s, and it was his last home. It had dark mahogany paneling in the first floor library. I'd never quite figured out what Mr. Lindemann's business was, but there was so much machinery in the area, sawmills, etc., and there was a foundry. I think he had a machinery building or repairing business. Anyway, next to the Lindemann House was George Koval's home. Uh, it stood where the PNC Bank building is today. It was another elegant Victorian with a wide wraparound porch. I remember dinner in the large dining room when George's wife, Clara, brought in the meatball main dish to which I announced uh, that there were three and three-seventh meatballs per person. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, grandfather, uh, James J.G., now James J.G., also known as Jimmy G to his uh, contemporaries, was the father of Carl, the three boys, Merle, Carl, and Lynn. Um, uh, built a very late Victorian style house at the uh, southeast corner of Spring Street and Mears Avenue, which had five different woods in the dining room and a secret passageway from the street level to the attic in the back. James G had three sons, I mentioned Merle, Carl, and Lynn, and he told my grandmother if she would get him a daughter, he would build her a new house. My mother was born in 1896, and James, true to his word, built the house. Uh, John Lettick told me the story in which uh, James' sister, uh, who married Mr. Lettick of Montague, uh, would sell eggs and butter to my grandmother, her sister-in-law, once a week. One time, my grandmother told her sister-in-law to come to the side door on future visits. Needless to say, that was the last time Mrs. Lettick ever stopped by. <laughs> my mother inherited the home, and she, or more accurately, my dad, rented it for years. When gas rationing occurred in World War II, we couldn't get to Whitehall very often. Dad decided to call on the renters on one trip to discuss their long overdue rent payments. He found them absconded, and the house trashed. Reluctantly, he sold the house for $3,000 in about 1944 and 1945, and the purchaser, or successor, then sold to someone who erected the current architectural masterpiece, that square one-story cinder block building which houses the post office. <laughs> Guy Cole and his wife Effie lived in the 1884 home at the northeast corner, southeast corner, of Mears and Slocum. Right. which is now the White Swan Inn. And I recall several dinners there, including one where I came face to face with custard pie. Guy attended West Point after graduating from Whitehall High School, but he did not enjoy wearing ties, stiff collars, and other indicia of a regimented system. He was a very good student, did well in classes, but at the end of his freshman year, he had accumulated so many demerits for sloppiness, etc that he would be walking them off throughout his sophomore year. He accordingly said goodbye to his fellow freshman classmates, including Douglas MacArthur, and came back to Whitehall. Charles P. Seeger, who was mentioned earlier, lived on Slocum Street, uh, about one and a half uh, blocks east of Mears Avenue. He was a bachelor, an excellent cook, and had the biggest collection of pipes I ever saw. Charles was a composer in the Tin Pan Alley era, and wrote, I wonder who's kissing her now, I wonder who's teaching her how, and so on, and other songs for Broadway shows. Florence Lewis, the only child of John G. Lewis and her husband, Wes Hodges, who was a society dentist in St. Louis, spent summers in the Lewis house just south of the Playhouse. I think of her as a friendly grand dame. 
She had a somewhat regal bearing, but she loved a good time, and she and my mother were often in cahoots. Several times we all went to Schiller's Barn Dance, where we danced the Swedish Hummel. That dance began with three long, graceful, waltz-like sweeping steps which carried a couple to the end of the room. This was followed by a mad dash to the starting point, trying to beat the 100-yard dash record to begin again. Florence and my mother always attended the old settlers' brunch until apparently there was an acute shortage of old settlers. <laughs> Florence had a live-in companion, Gertrude. But the question in our family was, was Gertrude looking after Florence, or was Florence looking after Gertrude? After Gertrude and Wes Hodges both died, Florence married Mr. Gauthier. My mother enjoyed telling the story about the clause in the prenuptial agreement with Mr. Gauthier, who was at least 15 years younger than Florence, maybe more, which stated that Mr. Gauthier would have no bedroom privileges. <laughs> In return for looking after her, he was to receive a million dollars on her death. Florence, at her death, left a million dollars to a retirement home in St. Louis and another million dollars to a retirement home in Palm Beach, where she spent uh, many of her last years. She wanted to leave a million dollars to a retirement home in Whitehall, but there was no suitable donee. Uh, hence, the manager of the Hume home in Muskegon picked up the phone one day, and Florence's estate lawyer told him the Hume home was the recipient of a million dollar gift. Imagine the surprise at the other end of the line. In the summer of 1942, my brother Henry and I and my, our dad walked down Slocum Street to the peninsula where the Crosswinds Restaurant and Marina is now located. Mr. Jack Lyons, owner of a marine construction business uh, and also owner of the Lion's Den, you know, as you go on South Shore Drive, you see the Lion's Den off on the east side. Um, Mr. Lyons had set up a sawmill on the first 60 or 75 feet of level ground after the downward incline uh, of the infantryman. The mill had vertical wood board sides and, if I recall, a shingled roof and contained a large circular saw in a planing mill. I can still hear the whine of the saw as it cut two inches by four inches by eight foot long pieces of lumber from eight foot logs. <coughs> the rough two before us then went through the noisy, roaring planing mill where it would emerge as a one and three sixteenth inch by three and three, 13 sixteen inch by eight foot smooth piece of lumber which you could handle with your bare hands. At the end of the peninsula where the Crosswind restaurant now has, uh, you know, a little porch where you can eat and look out over the lake, um, was a hulk, uh, which reminded me of a clipper ship of the 1850s, but without any masts. Mr. Lyons planned to tow the hulk to the upper peninsula, load it with logs, tow it back to Whitehall, and keep his sawmill humming. My brother and Dan and I stood there, and my brother pleaded with my dad to let him ship out on the hulk. Um, uh, as a sailor for the coming summer, and I could see Dad was weakening. The rehabilitation crew were hammering some spikes into the side of the hull. And they go, bang, bang, and then a third bang, bang. In other words, it was dry rot for about eight inches after the first half inch of good timber, see. Um, the spike went in like it was penetrating butter. And the only thing Dad said was, forget about it. <laughs> and my brother had to contend himself with going to Annapolis two years later. Um, I've, always, I've often thought this uh, last sawmill on White Lake would be a great subject for a senior thesis in the English department at Whitehall High School. And I, so, I hope somebody picks up the suggestion someday. Because the number here did not end in 1907 with the closure of the Staples and Coble Mill. It really had about a three three month revival in nineteen forty two at the foot of Slocum Street. Well that's my remembrances.